So I thought that I would kind of just start um, with joints themselves. So basically, uh, not all joints are equal. There's different types of joints. Um, there's more common joints than others. Um, and the ones that we typically think of are um, synovial joints. These are the most common uh, joint in the body. They allow for a lot of movement. Um, this is basically where two or more bones um, come together. And then there's a cartilage layer that um, that uh, is also involved there. And we'll go over what a joint actually looks like. Um, they These types of joints have a kind of a outer capsule that's fibrous. And then within them is a um, what's called the uh, synovial um, lining or membrane. Um, within that kind of space is joint fluid or synovial fluid that kind of fills the, the space. Um, there's a normal amount of that. We kind of don't want too much. We don't want too little. We want just the middle kind of amount. Um, then there's fibrous joints. Uh, these are dense connective tissues. Um, and the, these types of joints don't allow for as much movement um, so some examples can be the uh, joints or where the bones of your skull um, or the joints of the um, uh, where there's um, meetings in the face where they come together and they're quite firm. And again, if you think about those areas and structures, not a lot of movement there like an elbow or a knee. Um, then our last type of joint is cartilaginous joints. These uh, are sort of the in-betweener, more movement than a fibrous joint, but less movement than a synovial joint. Um, and these would kind of, I think the easiest one to think about is the vertebrae. So you have two bones and you're kind of just joined by cartilage, but they're not necessarily totally encapsulated. So um, over here is just a picture of the pelvis. Just um, again, we have three major kind of bone groups that come together to form the pelvis. So again, we sometimes have um, some of these more fibrous type joints or kind of hybrids of, of the different types. Um, these are just some x-rays of the uh, of a horse's neck. Um, again, sometimes we um, use therapies or supplements to tackle these areas in the horse as well. So it doesn't always have to just be the leg. Um, and then this is just a fetlock showing a little bit of joint anatomy, but we'll go over that. Oops. You guys will have to bear with me. I'm not super um, fantastic with computers, despite maybe my generation. <laughs> um, so looking at some joint anatomy um, here on the left hand side is just kind of a general synovial joint. Um, so we have our, our bone coming down and then where the bones meet, this is the area that we're, they're interested in um, when we're looking at a lot of these supplements. So again, just to go over this, um, the articular cartilage, I want you guys to kind of pay attention to this because this is quite an important concept and layer. Um, and then sometimes we'll use fancier words like subchondral bone, which is just the bone just below that cartilage layer. Again, we have the synovium or the synovial membrane, which lines sort of the um, inner part of the joint. And then coming outside of that is the um, articular capsule here. And then within this space is where your joint fluid is. So when we poke needles or things into here and you see a little bit of that yellow um, fluid come out, that's, that's the synovial fluid coming from within the joint space. Um, again, this is just showing you in a different schematic, those areas and how we have basically two bones meeting, a cartilage layer, a capsule with an inner synovial lining and some fluid. Don't get too bogged down in this um, diagram. Basically, if you hear vets talk about an inflammatory cascade, this is what we're usually trying to target with our therapies. And um, the different types of supplements and therapies will act at different uh, points in the cascade, um, some with safer um, effects than others, depending on where they may act. So all I want you to get from this is basically as we wear and tear through joints or um, age or joints age, or we have traumatic injury, then we have some form of damage um, on a cellular level. And that's what kind of cues the body to start thinking about um, 
inflammation. And now inflammation is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Our goal is to moderate that cascade and keep it somewhere in the happy medium. So corticosteroids um, or, you know, more traditional joint injections or um, therapies, they often act higher up in this cascade and kind of shut everything down below it. Um, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, which are common, the common ones we use are phenylbutazone or bute, uh, phoenixin megalamine or banamine is the more common name, uh, Prevacox or Firococcib. Um, there's a meloxicam. There's a host of other ones, but those are probably some of the most common ones we use. Um, again, some a little more favorable than others, but they work just a little bit lower in this cascade and they keep a few of the good players of inflammation around um, while trying to take out the bad ones, but preserve what, what we need um, and the positive effects of inflammation. And with inflammation comes heat, there's sometimes swelling, um, but that blood flow um, and the heat are also bringing those uh, healing factors. So again, we want a little bit, just not too much. Otherwise, uh, we create too much uh, ongoing damage uh, to the joint or to the tissues. So what are the clinical signs of arthritis? Um, I think you guys probably know most of them or have dealt with them, but usually it's lameness and my horse isn't moving right. But if we kind of break down that word, um, then arthritis uh, really just means inflammation of a joint. So arth means joint and uh, itis, anytime you kind of see that, it's indicating inflammation of that structure. So um, you'll sometimes, excuse me, sometimes see osteoarthritis, which is generally kind of implying a more chronic progressive condition or sometimes DJD or degenerative joint disease. Um, again, there's some differences or sometimes uh, the terminology is used a little bit um, differently, but just think of it as joint inflammation for today. Um, so osteoarthritis affects the articular cartilage and sometimes the underlying bony and soft tissue structures as well. Um, so other signs can include excess joint fluid or effusion. Um, that's kind of the fancier term. And we may even see distensions or uh, puffy joints. And that's because that joint capsule is kind of puffing out with too much fluid. So for example, if we look at this knee, it's a little more sucked down than this big uh, knee here on the bottom right of the horse. Um, and so that's too much fluid. And what the body's trying to tell um, the animal um, is that I need to protect myself. So when my joint is um, in trouble, or maybe there's just too much instability in that area. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why fluid may be produced, but the body's trying to say, get some lube in there, protect myself. Um, and it's trying to do that quickly. Um, and so what will end up happening is we may produce a lot or a greater volume of joint fluid, but it's not actually, um, the same quality as normal fluid. In a normal joint, there should just be a little bit of joint fluid. It should be kind of um, a golden yellow and kind of stick, you know, to your fingers if you were to touch it and kind of peel it apart. Um, and uh, when the body or the joint becomes diseased, then we often produce more fluid of poorer quality. It's less viscous or more watery um, and sometimes a little less yellow or golden yellow than what it should look like. Those may be indicators of a disease joint. The other thing is, is that end stage joints or, um, basically joints that have fully lost their cartilage layer and are trying to fuse and have very advanced arthritis. They may not produce any fluid because the cells that are responsible for that, or the synovia sites, they are actually gone. We've worn through them. We've, they're gone. So, um, you know, again, that happy medium idea where, you know, too much fluid is probably not a good sign. Um, no fluid at all. If we were to do like an intra-articular or within the joint injection, that may also not be a good sign. So I just always think of the three, uh, three bears you want somewhere kind of in the meat, uh, in the middle. Um, other signs may be heat. Sometimes the horse may present as stiff. Um, there may be just a lack of willingness to perform, um, a job especially if they've done that before. 
um, so a reluctance. Um, they, there can be a reduced range of motion through the joints, and that's probably indicative of a little bit of decreased joint function, because again, we're not, uh, especially if we're not able through our therapies to restore the full range of motion, and that may be the case in advancing arthritis. Um, other things may be behavioral type changes. Um, I think the one that we see probably the most is an irritable horse. They're again, trying to tell you something, they just can't talk. So, um, so they may become very grouchy or just not their usual demeanor. Um, so the story of arthritis is basically that it's a progression and I've just pulled a couple little tables here. Um, because they highlight different aspects that I, I think we don't always think about. So um, again, we think about arthritis often as a more advanced condition, uh, one where there's radiographic or, or changes on an x-ray. Uh, maybe there's um, too much bone being taken away. Maybe there's um, more bone being laid down and the areas that these things are occurring in around the joint space may be important to or the structures that they involve. So um, this over here is just looking at um, uh, orthopedic problems in older dogs and cats. And basically they just have a little scale of, um, you know, how they use to grade mild or moderate or severe osteoarthritis. So if you see this OA, we're referring to osteoarthritis, um, you know, and it may, I, th I think the area both in, you know, most of our, our animals and especially our sport horses, um, we probably don't catch them at the earliest stages of arthritis because the signs are very subtle. So, you know, oh, maybe we just overdid it today or may, and, and that's still a possibility. Um, but, you know, there's, I think we excuse a lot of things that um, are actually the early signs. So that again, may just be things like stiffness, decreased activity, maybe a little bit of a limp all the way, you know, working up to pain and maybe atrophy of the muscle groups. Um, and again, usually as we advance further, we'll eventually lose range of motion. Um, you may also see other pain responses, vocalizations, you know, um, a jerk of the leg as you're, you know, flexing or doing things. Um, these are all just kind of general guides. Um, but then, you know, we can also come up with things like uh, radiographic scoring systems for x-rays. And again, you know, before we see radiographic change, we already have inflammation in the joint setting up long before that. So I think that's when you, when you hear vets or or uh, people in the barn debate about when to do, you know, joint injections. Um, there's it, treat every and every uh, animal as an individual, but you know, um, sometimes we can be doing things preventatively a lot sooner than waiting for it to show up on an X-ray, if that makes sense to everyone. Um, so again, going down the scale, you know, we have no effects seen to. Um, uh, you know, some sort of intermediate effects, um, like seeing some bone spurs or um, lipping on a joint space. That's kind of what this osteophyte uh, term means, um, all the way up to the point where the joint may be fusing. We've lost the articular cartilage. Um, we don't actually see any joint detail at all anymore on a radiograph. And I'll try to show you a couple quick pictures. So just keep in mind that arthritis and inflammation of a joint is occurring long before we see radiographic change. Again, you know, stages of osteoarthritis, this is looking at a knee, and this is just a schematic of a, of a knee. Um, but, you know, again, we're focusing on this bluer or this kind of cartilage layer. We have minimum disruption of the cartilage. You know, then we start to kind of break through that. Then we have, um, reduction in the size of the joint space, as well as maybe other, you know, um, signs of damage. Um, and then eventually, um, we're going to greatly reduce that joint space, we're going to lose all the cartilage. Um, arthritis is really going to ramp up because we're getting more friction, uh, you know, bone on bone kind of layer, and also more instability and in riding around on that joint. So um, the more that that happens, probably the faster the arthritis will progress. Um, there's some studies of experimentally induced osteoarthritis models in horses. So this study is a pretty new one from 2020. Um, I'm just pointing out this picture as a highlight that things can be 
quite subtle. And keep in mind that basically arthritis was caused in these horses and then evaluated over a series of weeks. So uh, to 12 weeks, we only are three months down the line. Keep, keep um, in consideration what you do with your horses and how long you've been maybe dealing with um, arthritis or joint disease. Um, it's probably been a lot longer than 12 weeks. So again, the changes you'll see on radiograph are probably more prominent, but this is looking at the fetlock joints of horses and all four fetlock joints were basically irritated to um, cause a fragment um, or some chipping. And you'll see as we kind of move on and down that we have some, eventually we'll have some roughening here at this joint, uh, at the end of this joint space probably a little bit of uh, abnormality up through here. Um, and again, looking at uh, these other pictures just from different views, um, we start to see some lipping here where this is looking more smooth than the earlier weeks. Um, and again, some spurring over on these aspects. So it doesn't always have to look very dramatic um, for the horse to experience some level of discomfort or pain, and that may translate into reduced performance. Um, but as you can see through here, we still have good joint detail. We still have, um, you know, good definition, um, but yet we still can see on some of our views an issue. So how do we combat it? That's probably what all you guys uh, wanna know. Uh, these, we'll go over all these terms. Um, so if you don't catch the acronyms right now, don't worry about it. Um, but basically there's different ways of delivering drugs or supplements to aid in combating osteoarthritis. I just kind of threw in tendon and ligament injury as well. We won't really go into all that today, but the reason I mentioned that is because some of these, um, supplements uh, also address either uh, flow on effects of arthritis and possible soft tissue components to that disease, or um, they may be useful in tendon and ligament injury um, or helping prevent those uh, injuries um, for your horse. So we can give something systemic or parenterally, or that's kind of the whole body approach. So um, the common ones are, again, your NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like butbanamine, Prevacox. Um, they come in oral and IV forms usually. Um, then we have polysulfated glycosamine glycans or PS gags. Um, these are usually given intramuscularly, but um, there have been studies on certain products um, uh, within the joint space, um, there does tend to be a little bit more risk there. So uh, vets and clients often use, usually prefer to give this intramuscularly. HA are hyaluronic acids. That's sort of like your, uh, your legend is probably the most common one you've heard of. Um, they have oral and IV forms. Bisphosphonates are things like osphos or tildren, if you've used them. They really work on um, bone turnover and, um, and osteoclasts or, or uh, basically cells that take away uh, bone and are involved in the normal bone turnover cycle. So that's where they work. Um, and then nutraceuticals uh, are often oral, and these are basically through your diet things that will give a benefit um, that is not a, I guess, traditional, you know, hard, fast drug or um, vet medication, for lack of a better term. Um, then we can get into intralesional or intrasynovial therapies. So basically, if we have like a tendon lesion, we can potentially put medications um, right into that lesion. Sometimes this will be done with guidance of an ultrasound. Um, then we can also uh, put medications or treatments right into the joint space or into that synovial membrane layer um, to um, address the joint itself directly. Um, the things I'm going to focus on more today are your um, oral and uh, sort of nutritional supplements. Um, so things like, uh, I guess NSAIDs would again be oral, but, um, they won't be the focus today. I want to talk more about things like glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, MSM, um, 
And then we'll get into some other things, omega-3 supplements. Um, and then I just don't want anybody to forget about it, adjunctive therapies and routine care because they're very important when we're, when we're talking about holding off arthritis um, or preventing it. Um, so Ferrari, body workers, uh, chiropractic, physiotherapy, um, and then don't overlook just general um, rehabbing if you if you need to um, if you have a specific injury or um, conditioning to pre again prevent injury or to keep your horse kind of in shape and mitigate risk of injury. Um, this is uh, actually one of my teachers at the moment. Uh, she's an animal. She's a human chiropractor who is trained and certified in animal chiropractic. Um, so this is just her demonstrating um, adjustments on the back end of a horse. Um, and then we have water treadmill and, you know, solariums and other things that can be used again for rehab and conditioning. So the first thing we'll talk about today is polysulfated uh, glycosamine and glycans. I know it's a big mouthful, but just think of them as PS gags. And the one that is probably the most commonly used um, and uh, is, in my opinion, a very um, good uh, therapy, both preventatively and to assist in treatment, is um, Adequan. Um, and so basically, this substance is produced from uh, cow tracheas and lung. Um, it's principally composed of another thing we'll talk about, which is chondroitin sulfate, um, and is a semi-synthetic kind of preparation of, of the bovine trachea. So um, it has chondroprotective or it protects that cartilage layer um, effects. And it also has some anti-inflammatory properties. Um, some studies have shown associations with reduction in the severity of clinical signs in both human and equine um, arthritis patients. Um, and it's thought to also inhibit many degradative, uh, degradative enzymes that uh, further damage the joint and contribute to osteoarthritis. Um, the root of administration is usually intramuscular. Again, it can potentially be used intraarticular, but we generally don't use uh, this intraarticularly as much. Um, and that's because there's just anytime you poke a joint, there's there's some risk involved. So it's not risk free. We need to be cautious about those things. Um, but we've found fairly good effects by just giving it intramuscularly. And that's also easy for owners to do at home. Um, one of the most commonly administered medications that is not a steroid. Um, so again, you know, thinking about the preventative things and keeping the heavier players in your back pocket for injury or when it truly is needed. Um, and then um, it's usually indicated in the treatment of cartilage degradation, synovitis, capsulitis, or osteoarthritis. Again, don't get caught up in those terms. It's just inflammation of the synovium or the inner layer, the inflammation of the outer layer or the capsule or osteoarthritis, as we've discussed before. Um, so we still don't fully know all the mechanisms, um, but we've seen that there's a significant ability of uh, PS gags to decrease lameness, modify osteoarthritis by reducing bone remodeling and promotes uh, the production of endogenous hyaluronic acid or basically hyaluronic acid that the body normally makes. So by giving this, you may also get a boost in the body's normal function and basically joint lube. Um, and then we inhibit some inflammatory mediators. Um, and again, some of the bad players like prostaglandin E2 that we don't necessarily want too much of kicking around. Um, this PGE2, again, think of that inflammatory cascade. It's just a piece of that. Um, there is a dose related effect on, um, fibroblasts and tenocytes or, um, like tendon kind of cells, uh, and their metabolism causing elevated collagen synthesis, non-collagen proteins and sulfated glycosamine and glycans. So basically it stimulates production of the normal components of these tissues and of the joint, um, to help restore it. So the way I always think about this is it's kind of like repairing the framework, um, while you still, um, while, while it's still there. So there's no point in trying to build a home kind of idea if there's no, if, if there's no frame to support it. So, um, 
in end stage joints, this may be less effective. So the idea is to give it before we reach that point and as a preventative. Um, then a very similar type of uh, drug it, that's not quite the same, but you can almost think of them similarly. Um, it's uh, cartrophin or pentasan polysulfate. Cartrophin is the trade or brand name. Pentasan polysulfate is the active ingredient. And this would be classed under disease modifying osteoarthritic drugs or uh, G modes. Um, they are normally administered either into the muscle or under the skin, but that's uh, in the horse at least is uh, extra label. Um, so not saying you can't, it's just you have to be uh, aware that we haven't studied that yet and deemed it safe. But I consider this a very, very, very safe drug. I've never had reactions with it. Um, and so I think it's a very kind thing on their system. And again, a useful drug in preventative joint care. The way this one works, we think, is by modula uh, modulating cytokine, which is another inflammatory mediator or player in that cascade. Um, it modulates its action and helps preserve um, proteoglycan content and stimulating HA or hyaluronic acid production within the joint. So basically trying to kind of boost the good players of, of the joint health there. Um, and again, the way this kind of um, we think works is through anti-inflammatory effects, and uh, it has some weaker but still present fibrino fibrinolytic properties. So basically, um, things that uh, may break down structures of the joint or the soft tissues, um, and then it has some anticoagulant properties. Um, and so the only uh, reason I mentioned that is because we think it may increase uh, synovial blood flow or blood flow to the joint and therefore have an effect on reducing inflammation. Um, the other reason that that may be important is if you if your horse is currently experiencing any um, anemias or, you know, uh, blood kind of issues, then we may want to pull a basic blood sample, see where those red blood cells sit. And we may want to hold off on these types of therapies just because they do have a, a slight anticoagulant effect. Um, some of the studies on this have found significant improvement in reducing articular cartilage fibrillation or kind of like damage and tendrils you can think of that as within the, the joint. Um, as well as near significant improvement in other variables. So what I think that's important is uh, considering um, future research, because if we're not actually seeing in some of the studies significant improvements in the measurables that we are looking at, um, but we're darn close, then I think that warrants further study. And who knows, time may tell that we may actually find um, significant improvements down the line. Um, and the best part is not really any adverse effects. Um, and again, think of them similar to things like adequan. Hyaluronic acids, um, these are uh, what we often incorporate into our, our joint preparations or when we actually poke the horse's joint. Um, again, these can be administered most commonly through um, IV or into the vein uh, routes or through oral means. Hyaluronic acid is a natural component of articular cartilage and again is something that the body normally produces. Um, just as we age, we tend to produce less. So um, the idea of either putting this in a joint or into the vein is kind of a little top up here and there. Um, hyaluronic acids sort of, um, they have anti-inflammatory effects, but they, they really act kind of like a joint lube. Um, and are responsible for viscoelastic and lubricating properties of that synovial fluid. Um, it has a very important role in the nutrition of the cartilage layer in that region. And uh, again, it's thought to decrease inflammation. Um, they've looked at some soft tissue uh, kind of studies, and they also think it may uh, reduce adhesion formation. So basically, uh, for if you think about the tendons on the back of the leg or something like that, Sometimes as we have injury there and they try to heal, they, they kind of stick together. That's an adhesion and it can 
create what's called a mechanical lameness or be a, a mild source of discomfort um, if the horse can't stretch those apart kind of adequately. So basically, if we're sticking hyaluronic acid or a lubricant in that area, then we may have better gliding action between those uh, tissue planes. Um, there's many formulations, scientific for um, scientific evidence of oral absorption and bioavailability and therefore distribution within the body um, is kind of lacking and, and we need some more controls there. Does that mean it is not a good thing to give your horse? No, I, I don't think that's the way to approach it. It just means we still have some questions to answer there. Um, one controlled double-blinded study uh, looked at yearling thoroughbreds with uh, OCD or osteochondrosis desiccans lesions. You can think of those as like joint chips, often in the hawk, sometimes the fetlock. Um, they were looking at the hawk and they showed that um, there was a significantly lower average um, amount of joint effusion or joint distension excess fluid there compared to placebo horses when treated at 100 milligrams by mouth once a day um, it's been invested uh, hyaluronic acid has been investigated and used for tendon injuries and adhesion prevention um, and the model that they were kind of looking at uh, was involving the superficial digital flexor tendon um, we have mixed reviews here. So one study um, showed fewer adhesions within the digital flexor tendon sheath um, when treated with hyaluronic acids versus other sort of lubricating substances. Um, and then some reports show no real difference, um, but they looked at re-injury rates in performance horses. So this is where we really need to, when we look at studies or when we look at information that's floating around on the internet, we need to understand what are they measuring? How are they measuring it? Have they controlled these things? Because um, where we get into some, some tricks with, the, with supplements is that they're not always well controlled. So um, things like Legend and uh, your common, you know, hyaluronic acids, they do have some some decent research behind it, but they don't answer every single question that we might have as a horse owner or from a performance standpoint. So we have to kind of work with what we have and make sure that there's nothing staring us in the face to say, no, don't use this drug. Um, fatty acids, uh, supplementation or omega-3 uh, supplementation, you'll hear us talk a lot about. Um, so polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs <laughs> are essential fatty acids that are usually found in fish um, and plants. Um, the two common ones are linoleic acid and alpha linoleic acid. Uh, those are your two kind of key acids. Um, studies have shown that omega-3 supplementation can reduce or stop inflammatory and matrix uh, degradative responses by chondrocytes or those cartilage cells during um, the progression of osteoarthritis. Um, some studies show uh, that horses uh, can demonstrate an increase in the concentration of EPA and DHA. Those are basically the things that you'll see on labels um, that are referring to omega-3 levels. Um, so they found an increase in levels in the serum of horses receiving that kind of supplementation versus horses receiving things like corn oil, which uh, from what I've seen tends to be higher in omega-6s. And I'll tell you the difference and why these are important in a second. Um, other uh, kind of substances that kind of fall into this group is acetyl, uh, Meristoliate, um, it's another fatty acid found in some equine uh, nutraceuticals or supplements. It's technically an omega-5 fatty acid. Um, and uh, it can, they think it acts to inhibit, again, things that are going to um, degrade the cartilage or, um, or that are bad inflam inflammatory mediators that we don't necessarily want around. Now, people say, well, what kind of oil should I... Um, should I be using? And uh, my kind of general response, if we're gonna be supplementing with an oil is, I think it's a very easy and quick way to tackle uh, the health of a few different 
um, areas. So it's um, good for the coat and the skin barrier. It's good for joint health. It's good for gut health. Um, and um, also it has some um, positive effects for the respiratory system as well, but they all basically relate to an anti-inflammatory type effect. So um, what they kind of say for the horse is that um, you do need a balance of your different omegas uh, through your diet and horses tend to get enough omega-6s through their green forages and hay. So that should be the mainstay of a horse's diet. And um, if they are receiving a, a fairly good quality forage or have pasture turnout, then they should really be getting those um, omega-6s uh, through the diet. And they are important and serve a function, but they tend um, in excess to create a more pro-inflammatory state for the body. And that's what we're trying to combat um, from the whole body standpoint, but also within the joint. So they say, if we're going to supplement with an oil, supplement with something that is generally more lacking in the diet. And we know the positive anti-inflammatory effects of omega-3. So why wouldn't you supplement with an oil higher in that? The ones that I've seen with high uh, omega-3 content um, and that have uh, fairly good research behind them are fish oils. Um, they probably have some of the highest levels of omega-3s around. Um, getting maybe enough fish oil um, can be maybe cost prohibitive, um, especially if you're running a bigger herd. I think that's why some of the plant-based oils have um, just been a little more accessible to people and to feeding their horses. Uh, my other thought is when I've looked at um, bioavailability in of things like flax oil in dogs, it's pretty poorly bioavailable. Does that mean it does nothing? No, I still think it has a positive effect. It's just if we can achieve higher bioavailability, um, then I, I think we're going to get a better clinical result. Um, coming back to the horse, they're more of a herbivore with um, the dog being more of an omnivore. And so if any of you guys are around and have had uh, have been talking to Chad about oils, you'll probably hear him say, I've never seen a horse eat a fish. And um, you can take that as you will. Um, but my thoughts there, um, this is not white paper or anything, but my thoughts are that um, herbivores, maybe there's better bioavailability with plant bases because that's kind of composes the, the normal portion of their diet where dogs, they kind of take a little bit from, uh, from plant materials and animal materials. So perhaps an animal-based oil is more bioavailable for them. I'm not sure. Um, but basically we want an oil high in omega threes. Um, and there's going to be uh, a bit of a range of what you can give your horse. Um, eventually you'll reach a threshold where I think you're just gonna, it's going to come out the back end of the animal and probably not be beneficial. So don't overload them, but we generally want to work up to a maintenance type dose. It's usually for most of these containers uh, with a regular pump about 30 to 90 mils, sometimes more depending on the oil type or what you're trying to achieve with the horse. So um, I would recommend um, a camelina, which is a plant-based um, oil, such as uh, this Campresco down here or Excelli Q is another pretty good oil. Um, and then uh, one that we carry here at the clinic is a flax oil that we've um, been able to keep on the shelf for long periods of time so it doesn't go rancid as quickly, which is, again, another thing that's prevented people from using them in the past. So um, there's other forms. Hemp oils seem to be quite popular right now as well. Um, the ones I've seen just tend to be higher in omega-6s. So again, using those principles, if we're getting enough through the diet, why are we supplementing with something that's high in omega-6s? I'd rather see an oil higher in threes. And again, we have some evidence to back that. Chondroitin sulfate. So I kind of talk about um, chondroitin sulfate, uh, glucosamine and MSM sort of together because you'll find a lot of formulations that incorporate combinations or all of them. And we think that sometimes when we use these together, we may get synergistic effects. So uh, I'll start with chondroitin sulfate. It's basically a long kind of molecule compose, uh, composing about 80% of all glycosaminoglycans in articular cartilage. So take home point there is that 
basically it's a, it's a main part of that cartilage layer. And that's one of the things we're trying to defend and protect um, against um, wear and tear of performance and against um, inflammation of the joint for whatever reason that may be there. Um, it's often derived from shark and bovine cartilage. It can sometimes be expensive to, uh, to make um, species or tissue origin. So example, um, shark versus the bovine uh, may, uh, or the cow, it may um, depend on the age groups of those animals as well. These things may skew um, or determine the concentrations and therefore the effectiveness and therapeutic results in the animal based on which type of supplement you're using or what source the chondroitin sulfate's coming from. So basically it can't be assumed that all products um, are created equal or have the same clinical effect. And unfortunately, this is where, um, you know, we get into, we get into that debate with, um, yep, I'm buying this supplement. It, it seems to be doing something for my horse, but you know, can I guarantee that? Well, no, that's where um, quality controls come in. That's where um, evidence-based research comes in. And unfortunately for a lot of these um, products, unless somebody really cares about them and funding the research behind them, we don't always have the answers. So then we have to go on sometimes clinical results, just try something and see. Um, as Again, as long as there's nothing looking at us saying, no, we shouldn't be using this in this animal. Um, chondroitin sulfates orally absorbed. Um, and again, the type of weight of the, the substance or the formulation may affect how it crosses the gut and therefore how bioavailable it is to the horse. Um, we have found that uh, you can achieve high concentrations in plasma as well as the cartilage layer and in the synovial fluid with chondroitin sulfate supplementation. So I think given that we know that it's probably getting to a level that's doing something for the horse, if we can detect it um, in those areas after being orally ingested or absorbed. Um, this substance has been shown to reduce cartilage degradation and uh, profound have profound inflammatory effects on a lot of different tissues that are involved in the metabolism of the joint. Um, Synovitis models in horses showed less effectiveness than your polysulfated glycosamine glycans administered intramuscularly. So may again, if budget is becoming an option or we just can't buy every supplement and that's very reasonable, not everybody can, um, then, you know, you may want to kind of play around, give an honest amount of time, you know, probably two to four weeks at least with um, these supplements and not make too many rapid changes, assess your horse. And then you may want to say, Hey, this brought me this far with my performance or my rehab. This brought me this far. I think this one's more valuable. I'm going to put my money towards that. So this is how I kind of look at this idea is that, you know, if some of the experiments um, are telling us that maybe we get more bang for a buck out of the PS gags versus things like chondroitin, well, then maybe we should allocate our efforts there. But Honestly, if you can if you can use these things um, together, we're kind of tackling joint health and therefore inflammation from multiple different angles, and we may reduce our reliance on things like steroids or non-steroidals, so that we don't hurt their guts as much, or you know have the the negative effects that are associated with those drugs. We may be able to reduce that risk by using some of these kinder um, substances and preventative. Um, supplements on our horses. That synovitis model, by the way, just measured degree of lameness, stride length, and carpal flexion. So again, you know, what are they measuring? So um, do we just want to feel good under saddle or do I not want to see any kind of limp or anything? Um, that's kind of, you know, we need to pick up those pieces of the research as well. Um, other studies show that uh, chondroitin sulfate may have therapeutic values despite how it's administered. Um, but they found that time of onset, understandably, was probably slower with oral administration. It has more barriers to go through. It's got to get in the mouth, down the hatch, absorbed through the gut, into the bloodstream, delivered to the tissue that it needs, 
you know, if we put it right into the muscle, um, there's sometimes faster absorption rates and therefore it gets into the bloodstream quicker and it doesn't have to go through all the protective barriers of the gut. I hope I'm not wearing any of you out. I know this is a little bit uh, uh, information dense, but these are a lot of the questions I get on a, a fairly regular basis and what I should be giving to my horse. So I thought we'd just cover the basic things that you go shopping for in some of the feed stores or that you might see in the vet clinic. So um, moving on to glucosamine, um, this is an amino saccharide or again, just a molecule essentially um, essential for normal cartilage growth and repair. So you're seeing the trend here. We're always trying to tackle that cartilage layer before we wear through it and get to a very unstable, um, high friction, high motion kind of joint that is progressing arthritis faster than it probably needs to. So they're often tackling this cartilage layer. So glucosamine has a role in stimulating chondrocyte or those cartilage cell uh, metabolisms. It can reduce inflammation of that cartilage layer. It's usually um, from things like marine exoskeleton uh, or beef carcasses. So um, sometimes you'll see things like green-lipped muscle in, um, in supplements, and that uh, can give omega-3 supplementation, but it also may be giving some glucosamine supplement. Um, and then there's different, again, effectiveness between different uh, forms of the drug. Um, and then it induces production of new cartilage cells uh, while protecting what is actually still there. It stimulates uh, proteoglycan and collagen synthesis. So again, key players in a healthy joint um, framework and joint metabolism while inhibiting, process, uh, while inhibiting the degradation of proteoglycan. And that's the thing we're always trying to boost and because um, it, it helps uh, restructure the joint and it makes up the tissues there. Um, we think that this may also uh, protect against some of the negative effects of steroids on cartilage. Um, and at high levels used during in vitro studies, um, so in the lab studies, um, they did not find that uh, these levels were achieved uh, when compared to experimental human and animal models. Um, this could take up to four to eight weeks to take effect. That's based on some human studies. Um, and it's likely best used preventatively prior to the advancements of disease of osteoarthritis. So if we're questioning, I've been giving my horse this supplement and I don't seem to see an effect, then we're going to either have to tune into more subtle improvements with our eye or again, what we feel under saddle, or it may be something that's not actually working. And I would encourage radiographs and a soundness exam to assess those things because we may not actually have in that region you're you're having the problem with we may not actually have enough cartilage layer for these things to be super effective are they helping possibly still a little bit but if that layer is gone and we have a fused end stage joint it may just be again not a wise choice of um money or or supplementation I'm not trying to promote different products necessarily. I'm just uh, pointing out some of the ones that I uh, see commonly or that uh, some of my clients use. So the pure form products, they have a bunch of different uh, supplements. So uh, glucosamine is one of them. You'll see another one, glucosamine plus. So you can uh, peruse through that. Um, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate are often combined. We think that these combinations in particular are synergistic. Um, and that they get more of an effect when used together than when they are individually used. Combinations may improve collagen synthesis in tenocytes um, or uh, basically tendon cells and also ligament cells, and they may uh, have an important use in accessory or joint structures or the things that are around and help stabilize the joint, um, but are outside of the actual capsule. Um, oral administration above recommended doses in horses was associated with a very good safety profile with no, but the thing that they were looking at there is no alterations to basically blood flow and clotting profile, uh, clotting profiles. So a common one here is Cosequin um, uh, joint supplements you may have used or seen. 
Um, there's again, a lot of other different forms. So shop around, um, ask your vets, you know, what they think of a product and, uh, maybe help, uh, get them to guide you. Um, they've demonstrated, uh, equivocal or, uh, success in research models. So basically one study showed no clinical benefit. Other studies have shown improvement. So I think all that information tells you is stay posted. You know, we may know more in the years to come with more controlled studies and advanced research. Um, clinical cases have demonstrated improvements in lameness, flexions, and stride length. So, you know, what we see in clinic or what the vets are seeing, they do think that there have been improvements in these areas. Again, sometimes we lack um, controls uh, with those kind of comments versus a study where we're each horse is grouped and, you know, the same thing is done to them. They're fed the same thing, etc. cetera. Um, navicular horses, which is a one of the most common causes of front end lameness and usually a word people don't like to hear. They uh, have shown a significant improvement in soundness versus placebo horses. So again, you know, tailoring your supplements to maybe a certain condition, this may hinge on an accurate diagnosis. So you can use these things for prevention or for um, treatment potentially. Methyl, I can never say this one, methyl sulfonyl <laughs> methane uh, or MSM. Um, this one's a little bit different than the other two, but again, something you'll sometimes see combined with glucosamine or chondroitin sulfate. It has a normal, it's a normal oxidative metabolite of industrial grade DMSO, which you guys may have used in um, sweats or that your vet may have administered to your horses for um, various, uh, various problems. Usually we're trying to decrease inflammation and um, scavenge or kind of mop up free radicals or sort of dangerous little molecules that can create further damage to tissues. We're trying to clean that up and get them out of the system so that they don't cause further um, effects. So MSM is naturally found in small amounts in fruit, alfalfa and corn. So I just, the only thing I would kind of want to highlight here is, you know, I guess this is technically a drug because it's having an effect on, we're using it in an animal to have an effect on something, but you know, these things can come from natural sources um, and often do. So they're not necessarily bad things to be putting in the animal's body. Um, so, you know, it, the, the thing that gets a bad rap are steroids and what we think of is more true kind of um, Western medicine vet things, but know that there's other options that have sort of these natural roots to them. Um, this can be a pro MSM can be a product, um, that's again, used on its own or in combination with other things. MSM itself. Um, the thing that's a little bit different than the other two is that it actually has an analgesic or a pain property. So the other ones kind of in a roundabout way, help either rebuild, um, you know, things in the joint, stabilize the joint, reduce the inflammation, and therefore we get a reduction in the pain response. But the thing itself does not actually reduce pain or work on pain receptors. MSM is a little bit different. It will. Um, in addition to having these anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. So antioxidant, again, think of scavenging or mopping up. Um, basically the free radicals that get produced when a tissue becomes damaged. Um, the route of administration is again, oral. Um, we don't know a whole lot about oral administration and therefore the safety or the toxicity um, of this substance um, or possibly how it's used in true osteoarthritis models. But some studies have shown that um, will probably exert a protective effect um, by again, mopping up those, uh, oxidative stressors and the inflam, uh, the inflammatory response, uh, through that are induced through exercise. And that study looked at jumpers. Um, they, MSM have also been associated with improved performance, um, in standard bred racehorses under training, but these studies, um, lack quite a few controls. So again, sometimes, um, we want to, you know, is it, is it the MSM or is it something else that we're using or doing with our training program? So those we can't always tease apart, but sometimes at face value, we have to accept that it's doing a little bit of something and that we did see a benefit after supplementing them. 
um, verse beforehand. Avocado and soybean unsaponifiable extracts or ASU, uh, basically unsaponifiable portions. Um, this is extracted from um, avocado and soybean oils. Um, in supplements, you'll quite often find them in a one third to two third ratio uh, respectively. So one third avocado to two third soybean oil. Um, the mixture is thought to have um, have synergistic effects, um, but we don't actually know what the active ingredient is yet or what is doing whatever it's doing. So again, this is sometimes where we lack controls and information in our studies and um, why labeling can be kind of confusing. Um, so, but we think that uh, the ASUs may have positive effects on the inflammatory cascade and structural components of the cartilage matrix. Um, and there was a controlled study that basically caused osteoarthritis in one of the middle um, joints of the, the carpus or the wrist um, in us, or what most people call the knee in the front end of the horse. Um, so they caused arthritis there um, and uh, failed to demonstrate a significant clinical effect. So again, verdict is kind of still out on this. Um, it's sometimes combined with glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate um, in some products. Um, other things that I think are very important and that we shouldn't overlook um, are foot care or farriery. Um, the way that I'd kind of like people to um, maybe can consider checking in on this is sometimes just simply through what are called farrier rads or basically two quick views of the foot um, from the side and from the front. And these tell us different pieces of information. So I just pulled up a set of radiographs down here that we can look at. And basically um, this is the bottom part of the leg with the coffin, the short pastern, the long pastern bone. Here's radiographically again, that cartilage layer is a the thin black space. Because cartilage is not mineralized and is less dense compared to bone, it does not show up. So a healthy joint should look kind of clear and black. Bone should look more dense. So if we're losing this detail in here or seeing, you know, spurring or more bone formation or gray that looks more similar um, to the bone and we can't discern this space, that's, you know, indicating arthritis. Um, but we may, um, in addition to performance, we may exacerbate or make arthritis worse by not just looking and ensuring that we have nice angles, that we have not too long of a toe, creating a big lever or like a flipper situation, which will create more strain on the back part of the leg or the heel. Um, again, other things that we can look at are sole depth, but that's just more for completion. We can look at heel development. Um, so basically this just keeps your foot in check so that we know that we're not at least no pun intended, but starting off on a bad foot. So, um, and then this view lets us tell a lot about balance of a foot and, um, up through the joint spaces. And, you know, this one, you can kind of see where, at least in this view, we're squashing this side of the joints, oops, squashing this side of the joint space a little bit compared to this side. Um, and uh, we can see historically, at least, that this horse probably had a, some kind of um, imbalance to the foot because we're seeing this side bone creep up. So this in and of itself is not necessarily um, a problem, um, can be on occasion, but what it's telling me more is an imbalance to the foot. And maybe we can um, have more routine care or just a better trim job and this is not a criticism of the farriers because they don't have x-ray vision. So this is where it's important for um, sort of the whole health um, approach to the horse, you know, the farrier, the body worker, the chiropractor, um, the physiotherapist, or whoever helps with your conditioning and rehab programs, um, the vet, you know, we all play different roles. And so if, um, if budget and uh, time permit, then lean on all of us for different aspects and see if we're seeing the same things and, you know, getting you to a place of performance together. Um, so, you know, I don't think you need to go crazy with x-rays, but maybe one to two times a year, just take at least those two shots and just see if we're in, uh, in good standing with our angles and with our balance. 
um, chiropractors, um, they generally work more on the neurology um, to certain areas and helping restore nervous function, which again, in turn, reduces inflammation, improves blood flow, um, and has flow on effects. Um, sometimes we think we want to put things back into place, so to speak. And sometimes that has become the horse's new normal, and we may not be able to do that. But can we still address compensations from injury or uh, again, just daily life. Yes. So it is maybe not the be all end all, but is an important piece and, um, of the puzzle. Um, the thing that goes really nicely with this to me is, uh, body work and massage, because if we have tight, tense, soft tissues that are pulling on the, uh, skeletal structures, then again, we're going to strain joints more. Um, and if we're, uh, employing chiropractic, then our adjustments aren't going to hold as well. So those two, I think work super nice together. Um, acupuncture, um, may be of, uh, some assistance. Again, I see it as something that's probably, uh, more to do with relieving compensations, um, of other, um, problem areas. Um, physiotherapy, lots of different modalities there, um, and, um, a very skilled set of hands that can become very important and they can also help support your vet. So they may find things that I don't pick up on, um, or, uh, just, they assess a horse in a slightly different manner. So we can lean on each other to again, get you to a point of, uh, recovery or to prevent injury. Um, and again, just, you know, not letting our horses get totally out of condition and then um, maybe be prone to an injury, trying to maintain at least, you know, a, a decent level of condition and fitness, um, because we know that when we become unfit or unconditioned, that's usually when accidents happen. Um, another simple one that really doesn't cost you too much is... Um, weight management. So, um, I don't want to harp on this. I bring it up in a lot of talks, but basically there's a lot of these, um, scoring systems that help us stay objective. So we're not sitting there, you know, going, well, I think they're fatter today, or I think, you know, they were skinnier two weeks ago, or, you know, these types of things It helps us look at the same things all the time and assess them in a relatively, um, systematic way and where we kind of want them is a four to five kind of level. So if you can aim in out of nine scale, sometimes you'll see these scales out of like a one to five or something like that. They kind of work on similar principles. So just pick one and stick with it. This one I got from Kentucky equine research. They're very good nutritional researchers, um, and leading, yeah, leading nutritional researchers for, uh, the horse. Um, so basically body condition scores, um, can be different than weight. We have how much do we actually weigh? And then we have, you know, maybe we're the appropriate kind of weight, but we can fill in, um, our rump or our top line, those types of ideas. Um, so just try to remain consistent is probably the key here. You can also grab weigh tapes. Those are super, um, cheap. Um, and as long as the same person's, you know, using the tape on the horse in the same way, then that gives us at least an indicator of something to follow. Um, again, you can log or journal, don't make a project for yourself, but you know, you can write dates, what their score was and track changes over time. Um, and then feed management, uh, so basically consistent people feeding. So we're not getting more feed one day, less feed another day, that type of thing. Um, for metabolic courses or Cushing's horses, you may want to test the hay and non-structural uh, carbohydrate content to help keep them safe. Um, and also at an appropriate weight and body condition score. And don't forget your vets and they can help guide and uh, guide your monitoring process. So I, I think that's kind of all I have there today for you. Um, but I'll see where Louisa's at for questions. So Chad is with me and he's just going to run in and say, hi, I'm just gonna put my little earphones in. So you guys can't hear me. Hopefully everyone can hear me. So Travis, if you can shut your PowerPoint down and just open his up. Okay. Bear with me. <laughs> uh, there was a few questions for you, but I feel like you covered them. One was thoughts on feeding canola oil. It's almost equal parts omega-3 and 6. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm trying to multitask and doing really badly. I'm trying to uh, 
get out. Oh, there we go. Okay, there's that. And then um, you can answer. I can just I can just uh, close this whole thing, right? Yep. Uh, so, um, oh my goodness gracious! I'm gonna I'm gonna come in there. <laughs> I think I got it. I got that closed. Do the same Travis, except worse. I just need to know where his is. I don't think it was on here. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. I guess I stay true to what I said. I, I warned them I'm not very good at this. <laughs> How do I? You can't see all the humans. I minimized it at one point. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, you maybe that bigger one. Here, should I go under the front? This is fun. Look at all these smart people trying to figure out how to use this. That's what I was trying to do. And I was like, I was. I think I was you're fine. Okay, hey, Chad, get in there. Okay. Um, am I, can they hear me on this? Though? Yes. Okay. Um, to answer the canola oil question, um, it can actually be useful for certain situations, uh, certain hind gut issues in the horse. So I'm not poo pooing on corn oil. Um, and I'd say a general rule between the oils is I'd probably rather see them on some kind of oil supplementation than none. But again, if you're seeing those omega-6 levels hike super high, then I just question, I think you're wasting your money because you're, they say that they already get enough of this through diet. Um, and then again, I think we're just promoting a more pro-inflammatory state. So, um, but the one thing I guess my teachers taught that I use not just with joints, but kind of all, uh, all aspects of practice is bring it back to your horse. So have we done something different than we did before? Have we given that an honest amount of time? Did we see a positive improvement? How are you measuring those improvements? Again, is it, we're just kind of given a quick look and we're not kind of tracking or measuring things, but you know, if it's, you want to see a better coat or, you know, them less lame, then, you know, stick them on a certain oil. Probably I'd say again, keep in mind your, um, slower um rates of absorption or uh potential for them to kick in and have an effect you may have to give you know closer to the month or a couple month mark for those types of things and again you can probably add a couple things but i wouldn't do too many changes at once so you know it's the oil and what it's doing um and then you know if that type of oil has provided a benefit um either an improvement in skin or coat uh less lame uh, less girthy or cinchy, you know, with, from the gut health perspective, then I say stick with that and keep running. But, um, I mean, always lean on the things we do know, and they've shown omega-3 rich oils are good for things like stabilizing red blood cells, uh, for your bleeder horses. Um, so your barrel racers and your race horses. So again, useful function from the respiratory system there. So if there's research saying omega-3 heavy oils for that, then I lean on omega-3 heavy oils. Is the canola helping? Well, yes, because it's got omega-3s in it. But so I'm, I'm okay with the corn oil. Um, bring it back to your horse and see if it's actually doing what you're spending the money on. I hope well, that answers what they need. Yeah, I think so. The only other question um, before we get into the joint specific injections, the articular injections was... Uh, XLEQ is a supplement and Travis did touch on that. That is a camelina based supplement. We have lots of clients that are on it. And just like what he said above, I think probably fits, fits with that. It is high in omega threes and it is a good supplement. Yeah. I think the two highest levels are usually your fact, the flax and your fish, but camelinas are, are pretty close. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Chad Hewlett has arrived. He actually snuck in halfway through, but I made him sit with me out here. Um, so he he'll, here. yeah, he's going to join, uh, Dr. Kelter. I don't know if Dr. Kelter's staying or leaving, but either way, we will cover the rest of the questions that you guys popped in here, um, towards the end of Chad's talk. So if you have questions as he goes, just, uh, type them in the comment box and yeah, we'll go from there. I will let Dr. Hewlett start. I'm going to move my slides forward. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. You know, 
Well, Travis is fixing things up here. He, oh, you just guys, gotta go. Okay, this one. You guys would have heard me say this before. Do you know the difference between an old bullshitter and an and a young bullshitter? So Travis tells stories. He's not really sure they're true. I tell stories. I know they're not true, but I believe them. Okay. So just so you know, we're gonna get that straight right off the top. So hi everybody. Thanks for coming and joining us on a Friday afternoon late and um, maybe enjoying a beverage or whatever that is at home, that sort of stuff. So um, today we're going to go through a few things. One of my favorite parts of practice is biomechanics and how we work with helping horses to return to normal biomechanics. So you're going to get a lot of that today. Um, my slides will be a little bit less, there won't be as much information on them. So if there's things that you're thinking about as we go through, Please write them down. Make sure you send the comments off to Louisa so we can get the questions answered. Um, this was this is a talk I've wanted to give probably for about the last 10 years. It just felt like this was the right year to do it based on uh, coming out of COVID and a few other things out there that just felt right. So it's joint injections, myth, reality, and more. Okay, biomechanics. And if you guys are just thinking about a little bit, biomechanics is essentially how the body moves how the muscles, the joints, and the tendons all relate to each other, and how that body is able to propel itself through space and time. Okay, so at the top there, let me see if I can get this mouse to work. Maybe I can't. There we go. Okay, so spine, just think spine. I, um, spine as far as like, it involves the head, the neck, and the back, and the tail, okay? Hip, again, is just what it sounds like. It's the hip, the shoulders, and the front. Those parts make up the axial skeleton. And if you really think about it, a couple of things are happening there where you see the C1, C2, C3, C4, and then you see the skull at the top. We have a central nervous system, and then it migrates as the spinal cord down through all those vertebrae to the tail, okay? So think, just take this for a second. Anything that's happening in that horse's environment comes from that central nervous system and runs down that spinal cord and then works its way out through the axial skeleton, okay, into the appendicular skeleton, okay? And I know this sounds very remedial, and I'm not going to try and make you guys neuroanatomist or uh, biomechanics specialist today, but I, I really want this to relate because this is what you do, okay? This is what your cat does. This is what your dog does. And definitely from the standpoint of every day when you're riding your horse, that biomechanics and that axial skeleton is figuring out not only them, but you, right? So th that's kind of what we're gonna come to today is some of these myths that I believe should be broken down a little bit. And one of the things I talked about with my one of my customers the other day or clients is that, you know, gymnasts are usually pretty well on their way by the time they're about 10 to 14 years of age, right? We don't wait until they're 20 and then they're completely mature. So I hear a lot of comments that, well, these horses are broke down because they were rode too early. I do believe that we shouldn't beat them up, but riding a horse early on in its life also allows it to develop its nervous system with a rider on its back or with a human involvement. If you let them become mature and then they have to figure that out, I believe personally, this is my personal belief and my professional bias, it's not white paper based. I always tell people, if I'm going to go in the ditch, I'll tell you, right? So, but I believe from watching horses over the last 26 years that those horses do well to have a human in their environment early on. Okay. So that's kind of one of the myths I wanted to talk about today that relates to axial skeleton and appendicular underneath. We're going to talk a lot about these two different categories as we go through this talk. Okay. If I say appendicular, it means lower leg. If I say axial, it's going to mean back, um, skull and tail. Uh, biomechanics, uh, we talked a little bit about the axial part before. Now I'm going to go into some of the lower limb in the front, carpus, fetlock, pastern, and navicular bursa. I want to relate back a little bit as far as like, so axial skeleton, we know that the nervous system is coming through and that it's working really well. As the nerves radiate down the legs, which is our appendicular part, you have all these different things that cause postural changes okay so if i have pain in my carpus or my wrist right like so for you and i this is this guy right you do things differently based on how that wrist feels 
So just magnify that with your horse because we're all standing on two legs. My wrist is not a weight bearing part, but if I'm a horse, that wrist is the carpus and that becomes a weight bearing uh, joint that does experience pain, re experiences reduced range of motion. And if you, if you really think about this, if my carpus fetlock pastern or navicular bursa has an inflammation and has a different change, it has a reduced or an altered change of motion, that's going to radiate through the shoulder. And then you've heard us talk a lot of times about, I'm now going to shift my body weight to the other hind leg. Okay. So if it's a left front, I'm now going to, in order to move my body weight as a quadruped, as a four-legged animal, I'm going to have to move my leg, my weight to the other side. The other thing that we have an advantage as a human is we don't have anybody on our back. Now that horse has some mild pain in that left front foot, like the bursa, and it has 200 pounds of saddle plus, you know, depending on the horse, it has another 200 pounds of human. And sometimes we like to hook onto steers, right? Or calves or logs or packs or whatever it is, right? Jump really high objects with humans on their back. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk, I want to make sure that we're bringing home that these biomechanics, it's almost like that comment of if a butterfly flaps its wings in South Australia, and now I have a hurricane or a a big tidal wave in Southeast Asia, right? Like think of these biomechanical things that if I have a little bit of pain down in my navicular bursa or my pastern, that's not just that spot. My, my whole body, i.e. the horse's whole body is responding to that. And that's biomechanics, right? Our goal uh, with being veterinarians in sports medicine is to get those biomechanics back to normal as fast as we can. Okay. And as healthy as we can. So sometimes that ends up being um, looking after certain areas and doing things where we can kind of set them in a spot where we get that back. And that's going to be part of the talk today. Okay. Um, so we got our hind, this is my, this is the rest of my leg going up, right? So I got the, on my right, I've got my definition for the, um, for the front leg. But on the left, I've got stifle, hawk, fetlock, and pastern. So think of stifle in the back being your knee, hawk being your ankle, fetlock being one of your toe joints, and pastern being out on your out on your toe, right? Like so metacarpals and stuff, right? If we go into that again, if I have problems in my left stifle, it now radiates into my right front leg. That can be the shoulder. It could be the foot. You know, and it's going to transfer back and forth. We're going to see this diagonal happen quite a bit in a horse. Um, this, so then now that we've talked a little bit about biomechanics and wanting that to be as normal as possible, and if it does become abnormal, how do we change that back? And it, it's rare for me to go through a day of talking to someone being like, well, my horse really can't have any problems. He, has, he or she hasn't done that much, or he's not that old. I'm like, well, but what if your horse does have pain? And what if it's there all the time? And it's just not at a level, because they tend to be a little bit more stoic than the average human being, okay? So horses will deal with or adapt through their uh, axial skeleton and their appendicular skeleton to mild pain, right? And a lot of times what we'll end up doing is we'll see horses that just, they don't freshen out as nice as they normally do. You know, when you start them, it's only normally it would be really good in about five to 10 minutes. All of a sudden it becomes 15, 20 minutes before they feel really fluid. Right. And you, and you, you've definitely heard me say this, that when I go to CrossFit in the morning, I look about 53 for the first 15 to 20 minutes. And then I look 26. It's all, it's all just the fluid activity, right? I've got a shoulder. I've had a knee that's been operated on. I've been kicked in the, in the gut by horses that have been knocked down. You know, so there's a lot of things that 53 year olds carry that 26 year olds don't carry just from life experience and just having things happen to you. So think of your horse the same way. Every day, most of us show up, even though we're not a hundred percent, that definitely means that my right knee doesn't move as well as it could. So I'm going to be in that altered biomechanical state. So that's where we come into this preventative versus reactive equine sports medicine. And, you know, I, you know, Louisa said this before, and you've heard other people say, you know, 
our clinic was the house that injections built. Okay. And I, and I smile at that because it is true. We do do a lot of joint injections, but it's not because we're trying to butcher horses. That's I, I want to make sure that's one of the myths that I'm going to kill today based on how we do things. We don't stick needles in horses because it feels good to us. And, and it's a, a way of like making horses go into the pen when they shouldn't. The goal for the last 12 years for our practice has been this preventative versus reactive. It's not very much fun to fix really broken horses. And if we're being really honest with ourselves, the chances of fixing or being reactive to a broken horse, chances go down to like 30% for you to have a horse that's going to be a really good athlete. If I'm working in the preventative category where I'm touching joints that maybe don't have radiographic changes, the horse doesn't have tons of swelling and doesn't have tons of heat, but it's positive on a flexion test. Its biomechanics are altered. If I'm in that slightly agitated or area where we've got some inflammation, but that horse isn't broken, we do really well. It's like 80 to 90%, right? Like it's a very high success rate. We find those horses end up being more competitive. They are able to win more. They are able to stay in the game longer, right? One of the biggest bridges for me to, to come to was when I first started injecting cutters and they weren't even three years old. And I would wait until they were three because I felt like I was a I was being a bad vet because I was injecting them before they were three years old. We ended up tearing up stifles, hurting suspensories, and all these other things. Because I would be like, well, I can't inject them. It's only January or February, and they're not three until May. Well, we finally got past that. And we just said they need to be comfortable, right? They don't have radiographic changes. They're, they maybe have some mild heat or they have some swelling in some certain areas. But once we started injecting them, the training went along better. The trainer could spend more days on them. There was less fights, right? So, um, you know, those kinds of things, they came along and they were able to do their job and the horses weren't, they just weren't as fractious. They didn't get wild in the pin, right? Because they weren't in that mild pain area. So that's my, one of my soap boxes for the day on the axial skeleton. I think as we come along in this world of modern injections, you know, we see us doing a lot more facet injections. So that would be like C, C7, C6, C5 kind of down at the bottom. We're also doing more SIs than we used to. Again, that's, those are two big power centers of a horse. And I think sometimes by looking at the preventative stuff, we can do quite a bit for these horses by working on their axial skeleton ahead of time. Maybe, and this has been postulated by a, a very famous sports medicine vet. His name is uh, Philippe Benoit, and he works on uh, international jumpers and dressage horses in Southern California and Florida. He talks a lot about looking after axial skeletons long before we have problems with the hawks and stifles in these young horses and older horses, right? Uh, appendicular, again, we just want to make sure that those horses, that left, left hind is as solid as the right hind. And sometimes when you have inflammation in those areas, you just need to knock that out earlier, right? And that, that's a, it is controversial. Um, you can tell that I'm far to the right. I'm, I'm very much like, hey, we need to do our deal here and keep these horses going. Some, some practices would be a little bit more on, I guess, I guess we're far to the left. Some would be a little more conservative where they'd be like, well, you need to do this. The horse needs some rest. It needs some butte. I'm not poo-pooing that. I just want to make sure that we talk about the fact that it's okay to be more preventative versus reactive. Tradition. Now I'm going to go into kind of the things that you would hear people talk about and the things that we use, okay, to try and help pinpoint these areas. So if I have a, a sore uh, articular joint, okay, Travis talked a lot about um, muscle injections, IV injections, and then oral feeding, right? So what we're going to talk about now is like a targeted um, type of traditional injection. So hyaluronic acid, he talked about that in his talk, and then steroids. And again, these two have been, um, I don't know if I want to say mislabeled or Maybe they've been beat up a little bit, sometimes in the media, as far as football players and different things like that. When we come to our horses and we're in a preventative program and horses are not broken, okay, this is the football player that has the shoulder that's probably been really hurt and they've been performing with it too long or a knee that's been hurt. And then they do put steroids in it and they go out and they play their game, okay? 
that's we're avoiding that in horses, right? We we tend to look away from waiting until that horse is a reactive situation and then injecting those horses too late. If we're going to use these products, we want to use it as more of a preventative and we want to be early in the game. Hyaluronic acid is going to be a bathing substance. It's going to help improve the gliding over the cartilage and it helps to stabilize the environment, okay? Steroids, trimcinolone, Predef, which is isopr isoflupridone. Uh, Travis was talking about having problems saying words. I'm the same when it comes to, uh, to Predef. Depomedrol with this methylprednisolone, okay? These are the kind of common players that you'll see. HA is going to give that sort of reducing the synovitis, help that joint be a little bit more lubricated. Your steroids are just going to take out the body's inflammation, okay? What it does do beyond that joint, though, if we come back to our talk about biomechanics, if I have a sore elbow and that sore elbow has been there for a while or I have my thumb or my finger sore, I'm going to use that hand differently than when it feels good. Our goal is to try and get these horses back to their normal biomechanic patterns as quick as possible, okay? And the longer that you are in an ill pattern or a faulty pattern, I mean, just look around when you go to, this, when you go to Walmart or to the store um, or on the internet, just watching people. Like how many people do you see with their shoulder all rolled forward and stooped and they limp when they walk, right? Well, think the same thing for your horses. That's a repeated nerve neuromuscular pattern that's been going on for years in a human. That's why we end up stooped. That's why we end up with neck arthritis and all these other things is because the pattern has been staying that way for a long time. We haven't corrected it with pain relief, proper flexibility, that sort of stuff. So for horses, this is a big part of getting that nerve, those traditional, sorry, getting the correct biomechanical patterns reestablished. The longer they go in an ill pattern, the harder it is to fix, okay? So if you keep thinking back to what I said, our practice is based around not allowing those patterns to become too far down the line, right? Let's go to sort of modern and regenerative. So these are all gonna be like the TA and the HA that I talked about, the, the traditional injections are an intra-articular injection. The modern or the regenerative injections, a lot of these are gonna be um, in the joint or they're gonna be in a ligament or a tendon, okay? And again, I don't wanna to get too deep into different things, but the top first one is called IRAP, interleukin receptor antagonist protein. The part on, the, on the, the, the description just tells you what it is, okay? In general, IRAP is a normal body painkiller that the horse is already producing. What we're doing is magnifying that and then we're extracting that magnified part out and then sticking it back into these areas that have the inflammation. What's nice about this and appealing is, is that we're using the horse's own body to do it. And it gives us a very steroid like or traditional type of relief so that that horse can return to its bio, proper biomechanics and not experience that pain that it was having, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip over the PAG, just I'm gonna go to the PRP. I'm gonna come back to the second one. PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Um, this gained a lot of bit, a lot of uh, traction in the news when um, Tiger Woods, who's probably one of the greatest golfers that ever played the game, probably ever will, had his knees injected and he and he became a different player after he had it done with the PRP. And it's really worked in humans. It's a very good product for us to use in horses. It goes in. We put it in the joints. Um, and we put it into a lot of soft tissue structures. That's probably the biggest area that it's used and gained the most benefit in the horses has been um, soft tissue stuff. It does work in joints and we put it in a lot of joints and bursas. Um, extracellular matrix, this Renovo, this is a beautiful product. Um, Dr. T's kind of brought this to the forefront. One of my mentors in Texas, Dr. Hannes, is he was in on the initial research They've been around for about five years. So what they're doing is they're taking uh, extracellular matrix from um, placentas uh, on a few farms in, I think, Arizona and Oklahoma, and they're, and they're taking out all the stuff around the stem cells and the stem cells, but they're actually ending up with just that, what they call the soup uh, in general. There may be a few stem cells in it's mostly extracellular matrix, but it's from a neonate or from a, a you know inside the womb 
which is still the best matrix and the best stem cells out there. There's no, no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? No babies die for this. Does that make sense? Like the, the foals are normal born foals. All they do is take the placenta after the birth and then make Renovo. It's a great product. And I think you're going to see that revolutionize the industry. And then the last one is one of our favorites, old, um, old stem cells. You get into fat derived, bone derived or bone marrow. You, you know, and there's arguments that go around one better than the other. Um, I believe that they both enjoy places where they work. Stem cells are a good product and they need to be used in the correct areas. We find that they seem to be nicely used in uh, like a, a tendon or a ligament injury and then uh, menisci and stifles. So kind of the soft tissue part around the stifle or the knee in a human, they've done pretty well there. Okay. The last one I want to talk about just a little bit is the polyalacrimid gel, Noltrix. There's another one called Cinnamid or Arthromid. Both of those are sort of the two big players in the industry. Uh, very good products. These are synthetic regenerative therapies. Okay. And when I say synthetic, they're not normally, they, they mimic things that are in the body, but they actually go in and set up in the joint capsule and change the environment inside of the joint. What's interesting about them is when you put them in, they don't disappear for a long time. They've been shown to stay in the horse's body and the human's body for up to two years inside that joint, but they are there to turn on systems inside the body. That's why we would call them regenerative because they don't, they don't have a direct effect. They have a secondary effect by using the horse's body. I want you to just come back to two things about these two different modalities that we talked about. One is reduction of pain at the area and return to normal biomechanics. Okay. I'm going to say that a whole bunch of times you're going to think that I'm losing my mind, but that's this whole talk is how do we get ourselves back to normal biomechanics and reduce the pain in that area, right? That's our goal. Okay. Um, stages of osteo. Okay. And I think Travis, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the first little bit. Um, we just, things just ran out, ran out a little long, but stages of arthritis. Um, I want to go through that just a little bit. And I believe Travis went through those. So one of the things to keep in mind is that when we're x-raying horses, we're look, if we see something on the x-ray, that's not the first stage of arthritis. Okay. I hear this all the time where, well, I want to, I'm like, I think your horse has hawk arthritis. They're like, cool. Can we x-ray it? I'm like, beautiful. We take the radiographs. There's not any signs of bony change. Okay. So immediately the conversation is, well, my horse can have arthritis. Um, I think it's our detriment in our industry that we, we haven't done a good enough job in the veterinary profession of, of explaining that arthritis starts in the soft tissue. Okay. It starts in changing of the environment. Okay. The kind of arthritis that we're talking about or that we're used to seeing is a destroyed joint, which is a late stage arthritis, right? And if you come back to where I was at before, you can either be preventative or reactive. Okay. So for me, if that horse is experiencing pain in that hawk, even though I don't have radiographic changes, I'm going to wait until the radiographs change before I treat it. That could be a year or two. So that horse is now maneuvering with a human on its back a lot of the time with sore hawks, right? With arthritis in his hawks. It's not a judgment. It's just a simple, if there's pain in the hawks, that's arthritis, that's inflammation. Are we going to wait until the bone changes and then start injecting the horse? And we hear that a lot, right? Like they're like, oh, I don't want to do it because there's not any changes on the radiographs. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying it's not wrong to also be in the preventative nature of like, hey, this is, it's warm. Flex is off. My horse isn't doing as good. He doesn't stop. He doesn't jump as well. He's still doing it or she's still doing it. A lot of times the mares do it better than the geldings. She is still doing that job really well, but there's pain, right? So the question is, is are we, are we being humane by letting that happen? That's not a judgment call. It's just a, I want you to think a little bit about it, right? So keep that in the back of your mind. That's some, that's one of the myths versus reality that I want to bring up today. Is my horse too young for injections? I talked about that before. I believe with the modern regenerative therapies that we have, if you're concerned about a horse that doesn't have, you know, solid mature cartilage and it needs some work done because it's a futurity cold or it's a young horse that you have high aspirations for, it's okay to put regenerative therapies in there, right? 
It's also okay to use some of the cortisone and hyaluronic acid judiciously, okay? That doesn't mean we just start firing away um, at these horses, but we're careful, right? And so we wanna watch that kind of stuff, right? And make sure that we're doing that. I don't think a horse is too young for most of the horses that are being ridden, okay? You know, like I don't really like injecting yearlings that are not being ridden. That's something we're definitely gonna do regenerative therapies in those horses. But usually that's because of some sort of weird athletic injury that's happened, non-human related. They've ran through a fence, they fell down, they got stuck in the stall. You know, those are kind of one-offs, right? I think for us, the too young thing comes in as I have an eight-year-old warm blood that's been in training for two years. Well, two years of training, they don't do dressage out in the pen by themselves. They don't jump six foot fences in nature. They don't run clover leaves. They don't cut cows for three minutes, okay? We got to wrap our head around that, right? If it was a human athlete and it was hurt and it was telling you it was hurt, you'd fix it, right? So anyway, I'll get off that that soapbox because I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be old and jittered or whatever. Uh, can you over inject? Sure you can, right? Like everybody needs to be careful. I mean, it's not a, we're not just going to run out and stick needles in joints every 30 days, we talk to our clients about the fact that managing a mature athlete with multiple problems, you know, like say hawks in the front feet or a sacroiliac and some arthritis in the lower facets two times a year. Okay. We feel like most of the medications that we use, the pain relief is pretty good for about six months. Some horses will last longer. Okay. But the reality is, is you have a horse that's a little bit stoic if it goes a whole year without injections or it goes two years without injections or maybe you're just not listening because the medication wore off a long time ago. Returning to proper biomechanics is a big part of it. So making sure that those horses stay in training and that they are not allowed to use their body in a way that's not proper biomechanics, right? When you see that starting to drift away, I think it's, it behooves us to ask us a couple questions. Am I not riding correctly? Do I need some more coaching? Do I need some more, you know, do I need some objective eyes on me as far as how I'm riding and what I'm doing? Or is my horse return? Is it becoming unsound again? And I don't mean unsound like shouldn't be ridden, but unsound like it's not perfect, right? And it's not getting good biomechanics, okay? If you pay attention to those things, I don't think you'll over inject, right? You know, in, in times when I first came into practice and ahead of me uh, in practice, and I've been at this since 1994, okay? So 96-ish is when I started. That's the first time I stuck a needle in a horse's joint was about my second year of practice, okay? Before that, we were sometimes using too much medication because it filled the syringe and we didn't have good evidence-based medicine. Since all the evidence has sort of kind of started to drift in in the late 80s and the early 90s, I don't think we're using a lot of harsh medications in joints and we're not over-injecting um, in the sense of where it was at one point. So I don't buy that. Um, and that's my opinion. Again, I'm not saying I'm right, but that's my opinion. Okay. And that's the myth versus rel. Dude, do injections turn off my horse's natural ability to create joint fluid? You know, and I, I don't have any evidence-based medicine to say here in the sense of like, oh, this is this, is this, is that. I don't believe that that happens, right? So one of the things that we, we hear a lot of times is, well, if I do this, my horse won't produce that. I, I don't know that I agree with that. I know that it's pretty strong that if a horse is comfortable and moving in its proper biomechanics, and as Travis was talking about before, supplementing those things that need to be supplemented, these are athletes a lot of times, or they are horses that are in pain, right? So I want to make sure we stay on top of that. Okay. Um, thank you. Joint injections, myth, reality, and more. Um, I appreciate you taking the time on a Friday afternoon to listen to an old man babble on for a few minutes about things that he loves. Um, actually, that's what I was, that's why I was late today was I, had a couple more barrel horses that just needed some more loving to get ready to go for the season. They've got a few years on them and they got a few miles on them and the clients really wanted them to feel good before they started their season. All right, Chad. So we have a couple questions. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Thumbs up. You can hear me, Chad. I yeah, can. Good. Yeah. Perfect. I can. Um, so I think Travis is going to pop into just sitting out here. Um, the one that came was, and you kind of covered it, but maybe we'll just go back and do it again. Once you start injections, do you always have to continue? 
Yeah. So good question. I'll bounce this around the Travis a little bit too. So you can kind of, you know, cause Travis was the, just so you guys know, we started off with the, um, the information part and then you had the kind of entertainment part at the end, just so you know. So <laughs> yeah. So, so we brought Travis back in so we can make sure we have all the facts in place. Um, the question is, is like, can once you start injections, do you always have to keep injecting? I, I I'll, I'll, I'll answer. And then Travis can put his two cents into Here's the thing. I always say that if the horse enjoyed how they felt and now they don't enjoy it after it wears off, the answer is yes, not because the joint injections crippled or didn't allow the horse to recover. It's because the horse has a problem that needs some form of management to keep that horse comfortable. So it's a two-faced question. No, you don't have to, but I can tell you that if the horse is it 15 year old and you did the injections and it felt like it was a four year old again. And then eight months later, it feels like it's 15 year old again. It's because that horse is now back experiencing that osteoarthritis or whatever was causing the pain is back again. Right. So a lot of times those horses do end up getting more injections, not because the injections made it happen. It's because the horse felt better. And now it's returned to that spot spot again. Um, sorry, I'll get in here so you can see if you even care about that. Um, <laughs> the, I don't quite know how to unwrap all the, the thoughts I have here, but the way I kind of look at this is again, pers- perspective. So, um, w- why are we injecting the horse in the first place? So does this hinge on a diagnosis or does this hinge on a feeling or, you know, what, what is, why are we doing that? So usually people come into the vet and say, you know, something's not right with my horse. So there's already something that they perceive is um, not going the way it normally did. So to me, that's usually lameness or a pain response or, you know, ir- behavioral changes like irritability and stuff like that. And I'm not saying just inject your horse cause they're irritable. But um, things we're looking for are heat, pain response, inflammation, uh, decreases in range of motion, um, and then and what they look like, you know, um, moving and through a dynamic exam on a circle and the straight, you know, on the straight trot and stuff like that. And then we basically take all those findings, piece them together in our head. And then that leads us usually to some form of imaging um, which is going to give you a diagnosis. And so again, bear in mind, we sometimes have the onset of arthritis much earlier than we see radiographic change. But if we're starting to see subtleties and, um, or, you know, they match, um, they match kind of the rest of the puzzle. So maybe the horse has, um, quite effusive hocks. That's a common thing that we see. So lots of extra fluid on the hocks. We know they're a working horse. Why would you have lots of extra fluid on the hocks? Hopefully it's not just from standing there. Otherwise, you know, we might have bigger issues, but, um, so there is a reason to inject. So if you're just sticking needles in, you know, a young, young horse, um, for instance, just to, um, prevent, well, then maybe things that we can be doing, um, Uh, for more of a preventative stance in those young horses are things like platelet rich plasma that actually help regenerate tissues. And again, bring that focus back on the cartilage layer, the joint health, dampen the inflammation and the bad players before it becomes a radiographic or, you know, problem or, or something identified on ultrasound, but you should always really be tailoring, tailoring your therapies to a thing that's occurring in the body. So, and again, that may show up on a picture, that may be something that you clinically assess with your hands and your eyes. So you, I guess, you know, my thoughts on if you inject and have to always inject, well, there was probably a reason that brought you in for the injection. And I think whether or not there's an image that supports that, as long as some either the clinical exam or the imaging, you know, gives you good reason to inject, then I say you do that. And we know arthritis is progressive, so we can slow it down, but it doesn't go away. So to me, I don't know if it's that you poke the joint and you always have to inject after that so much as you're identifying an early problem that's going to require management. I hope that kind of, you know, long winded, but that's my style. (laughs) Not you. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, 
I agree with Travis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next question, um, Adequan versus Legend. Which one is more recommended in your practices? I'm you're gonna keep, I think, hearing me say the same things. They they do different things, but I guess in in the different um um, legend or hyaluronic acids, more like a joint lube, polysulfated glycosamine and glycans. Think of them more as like a stabilizer of the cartilage layer of the joint. So we have two different functions. So again, if we can add those both in, you're probably getting a better, more well-rounded clinical outcome for your horse. But um, at the same time, we know that those drugs are going to work a little bit different for different horses depending on why you're using them. Is this pure prevention or is this treatment? If it's treatment, do we have an accurate diagnosis? What's that diagnosis? Is it arthritis? If it is, how, where are we on the scale? Do we see radiographic change? If we don't, we might be early. That's kind of a thumbs up for me for using Pentasan or, or PS gags. Because again, if we lose that cartilage layer, that's where that medicine functions. So if you don't have it, you're just, you're putting it in the horse, but it's not going to be doing anything because there's no cells there to work on. So your legend though, that will make it into the joint space and has more of an effect with the actual synovial fluid. So, you know, there's, even though the, the joint is sort of one entity, there's multiple structures within that joint. And these are what all these different things are addressing. So when you hear us say things about multimodal pain relief, or, you know, basically tackling joint care from multiple angles, um, they, these drugs serve slightly different functions, but what most of them end up doing is reduce inflammation. And um, then they may do things like stabilize um, the cartilage or, you know, provide lube to the joint and in roundabout ways, reduce the pain. So I'd ideally like to see them used together is the, the short answer, but if you have to pick one, then as long as there's still a cartilage layer to the joint space, then Pentasan or, um, your PS gags like Adequan are your friend. If there's no, and then again, certain structures like bursa structures, so the navicular bursa or whatever, sometimes hyaluronic acids are more appropriate for areas like that. So, you know, it's, it's, what are you trying to achieve with the outcome? And do we have an actual diagnosis that we're targeting or are we just using these preventatively? I like Pentasan. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just to drop in real, just a couple of little drops. So Travis hit the nail on the head. You're, if you're giving legend to a horse, it's going to work on the synovial fluid. Most horses will enjoy some benefit from that because the joint fluid is always going to be there and they're going to need mm -hmm. it. Um, the Pentasan or the Adequan is one of those things where it's, you, you do need that cartilage layer, right? So if you, and um, you've made a comment earlier about one of your professors that I thought was brilliant too you said, bring it to the horse and let the horse tell you. Yeah. Right. So I, we, we say that to clients a lot, like, Hey, let's, this is the one that we feel is most appropriate, but if they go home and they're like, that's not really working, well, then we need to change. Right. Like, cause you, sometimes you're going to pick what you think is correct, but the horse didn't read the book, so to speak, or maybe there's some things that we just can't see because of the yeah. Im imaging doesn't allow it or whatever at that point. Right. And so you can see some horses respond better yeah. to Pentasan. Yeah. Um, I would say that I use the Pentasan a lot, Yeah. Uh, which is kind of our adequate at the moment. Yeah. It's probably the closest thing that we can get up here um, to it. And, and yeah, I, I don't know, like, like Chad said, they don't always read the book. So, you know, we know based on research and evidence or, you know, what we've seen over the years um, through our examinations and clinical experience is that, you know, probably 90 plus percent of horses will fit the model for that disease process. So, you know, if it's arthritis for this example, then, you know, we know based on those studies with relative certainty that things are going to respond to that medication but every once in a while you're going to get a handful or a group of horses that something is not responding like you anticipate so take a step back reevaluate and treat the individual so navicular is a really good you know example of that there's lots of different ways to shoe a navicular horse um, a lot of them are trying to achieve similar effects 
but sometimes a shoe works better for a certain horse than another. So, you know, and then, you know, why do some horses respond to osphos for navicular and some don't, you know, so it's, you've always got to treat the individual. And if you keep, you know, doing the same thing and getting the same results and, you know, expecting something different, then we, we've got to regroup at some point. So just because it's worked for one horse doesn't mean it will work for the other, but we can make general assumptions again, based on data and research that say most of them are going to read this, this way. And then Chad, another question came in, um, to maintain joint health and reduce inflammation. Do you recommend IV IM medications such as legend or pentazan in an older horse who also gets regular injections? And so to just piggyback off of Travis stuff, if it's a perfect world and our budget allows, I don't think that's ever wasted. Uh, and I tell people freely all the time whenever they're like, well, can I get my short, you know, my horse a shot of legend? And I'm like, yeah, wrong guy to ask. Cause I'm always going to say yes. Like, I just think there's so much benefit from giving extra substances, so to speak, because these horses are usually under stress, right? And they're usually doing some stuff. Most of the horses we're looking at, or they already have a disease process that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's making it difficult inside their joints. Mm -hmm. It's some, at some level, maybe it's only one or two, maybe it's four or five. Um, but yeah. And, and, you know, just the little insults that happen throughout the day for a horse in training and the recovery part, I don't think it's ever wasted in my book. It just depends on when we're going to add it in and whether our budget allows. I try, I try to think about humans because that's what we're used to thinking about ourselves. Um, I, I think about athletes and runners that you may know. Um, and basically, you know, they think about Olympic athletes. They are often injured um, and come back from injury. Do they still have problems? Do they experience discomfort and pain still? Yes. Can they still run fast? Yes. So, you know, the idea is not to be totally pain free. The idea is to moderate inflammation and therefore moderate the pain response. Um, and for people who are worried um, about or have concerns about, you know, injections into the joint, and that's understandable, it's a, a risky procedure, you know, um, and then, uh, or have concerns about steroid effects, then, you know, I'm still not saying don't that your horse might not need those things, but these other substances may help reduce our reliance on those, on the things that cause more problems. So, you know, do we, let's just make a little case example, I guess, like, are you having to inject your horse, you know, every six months or every year, you know, most injections will last somewhere in between that period more advanced disease or arthritis, those horses uh, may only hold, you know, closer to the six month mark. But if we're falling off, you know, probably before that, we're either not in quite the right area, um, they're pushing through something. So maybe their compensations or, you know, other legs are, are causing too much issue to adequately respond. Um, but the ones who are, you know, maybe lasting an appropriate amount of time, we could maybe get them to closer to the year mark or just over, through use of these other things. So, you know, not having to put as much in them as frequently, that kind of idea. And then kind of on that, um, the last train of thought there with the, the Pentazan and the legend, somebody asked, what about compounded polyglycans? Yes, they've, uh, there's quite a bit of, um, there's a few uh, studies um, that have looked at uh, things like that. I'm, blanking on the nitty gritty details, but they have found similar benefits. And again, you're, um, you're looking at that cartilage layer and addressing that. So yeah. And, and so, some of these things are precursors for others. So for example, glucosamine precursor to chondroitin sulfate. Um, so if we're putting glucosamine, then you have the building blocks to build your chondroitin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate show to help with, you know, compression of joints and reducing the effects of that. And so why would we compress a joint? Well, performance or wear and tear where we're loading the leg, you know, so those kinds of ideas. So some, and then sometimes, you know, using these things in concert or together, you're getting, you're getting 
multiple different effects that work together to actually give you a greater outcome than if you used each of those individual things only in a, in a horse. So, um, yeah. Did you I, talk about, I'm sorry, I missed Travis's. Did you talk about it? The mixture? Yes. Yeah. So you, so just so everybody knows, it's usually HA yeah. glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate are the, the products that are in there. Yeah. Right. And so they're mixed in at a certain kind of, they try to make them into a synergistic yeah. type of injection. I right. guess, I guess what I'm trying to point out is think about the, the word. So polyglycans, polyglycosaminoglycans, they're just different molecular structures, but they all are using sort of the same building blocks in certain ways. Yeah. So yeah, they'll provide benefit for your horse. Yeah. If I added in a, a personal preference for this, sometimes, um, you know, you can give a legend shot. We do the loading and the pentasan and do loading. Uh, and then and this is, this is definitely not evidence-based. This is just my practical feeling is, is that if I have clients using a polyglycan, I would prefer that they use it on a pretty regular basis. Okay. Um, just like, again, I don't know. What do you think on that side? I, I, I say to people, if you're going to use a polyglycan, I wouldn't give it once every two months and expect it to have a long lasting effect yeah. based on the fact that there's these three products in there and it's usually a little less than than the others as far mm -hmm. as like uh, I've, I've often and again i might be wrong but i always tell them i feel like we should be giving this every month or every two weeks yeah i the a lot of the like more nutritional or oral kind of things this this can't be used for everything but um you know i i think about it like eating your fruits and veggies you know if you eat run fruit or one veggie or you know one super fruit a day <laughs> you know, uh, or just once every once in a while, you're probably not going to get much of a benefit. But if you eat a small amount, you know, every single day, then the cumulative effects over time, um, I think that's where you probably see the true benefit. So for things, for example, like oral hyaluronic acids, or, you know, sometimes powder versus liquid forms of things, you know, and their absorption rates, um, then, you know, if we just give, uh, you know, a monthly kind of, you know, dose of it, especially if it's an oral thing, I don't know if you're going to achieve what you want. So if there's a study we can lean on, we should lean on that. If there's not, then we may just have to, you know, try a little protocol, give it an honest time, watch the horse. If it's not working, come back to step one, regroup. If it's working, keep moving forward. So that's kind of what we mean, I guess, by treating the individual um, at some point, you know, and this is where logging, you know, can help or just making a few notes for yourself, because then you can decide for yourself what was good value for you and your horse and what level of performance you're getting to. You know, some people don't care about them being perfectly sound. Some people just want them to be comfortable and, you know, ride around in the paddock or go on the odd trail ride or something. Some people need to get to that very top level. If you need to get there, you should probably be adding in all of these different types of things because then the subtle differences are probably going to make or break you in your sport. All right. This is a question I think you guys will love. Would you recommend yearly soundness exams and baseline x-rays to monitor <laughs> joint health? <laughs> So yes. I don't know who sent that question in, but we're going to send you a thousand dollars. Okay. <laughs> that is bang, bang on. Um, I'll jump in real quick and then Travis can, you know, kind of elaborate, but we have built this practice around that evaluation of these athletes at least once a year, we're really looking to be two to three times a year on high end athletes or horses with issues, so to speak, or management things. So the answer is yes. And, and it's, it's just a matter of uh, awareness, right? Like from an owner and a, and a veterinarian standpoint, like the more we're able to, you know, look at a, a, a particular athlete with its owner, the more comfortable I feel, right? Like I feel like I have, I'm part of the game and so does our practice, right? Like it allows us to manage things just a little bit better when we get into that. So, yeah, I, I'm, I've said all, I've said more than I want to, but Whoever that was, we, we need a big shout out to you. So thank you. I think the big thing, yeah, I agree. Um, I think the big thing from the owner standpoint is can you potentially catch something before it becomes a huge issue? Because I know what people don't like and it's a big bill and a big pro rehab problem to deal with. So, you know, if we're catching the subtleties and having a trained eye who's used to looking at things uh, in a different way or... Uh, with more scrutiny than, you know, your average person, 
um, then again, we may pick up on things that uh, we find early and you then have the power to decide what you want to do with it. You know, do you want to treat it or do you just kind of want to gamble your odds and go from there? But the way I, I see us is we're kind of the relayers of information and, um, you know, again, you know, does your horse have pre-existing problems? Well, if we, I had one of these today, so it was a great example. Horse had surgery on both, um, its knees about five years ago. It still got a couple chips, um, that are probably not active and doing anything in there, but they clean most of it out, but there's still some pre-existing damage. Horse still has great range of motion through both joints. So what that's telling me is we're not near the end stage. We actually radiographed, not because uh, I actually think the owner pushed for radiographs more than me today, um, but she has worried for the past year that she may be doing too much for her horse. Um, I didn't think so today. The horse needs help and management, but radiographically um, compared to our baseline last year, um, the horse's um, knees did not, uh, you know, progress significantly. There was mild progression of the arthritis. We still had a good cartilage layer. Um, she hadn't used Pentasan before. We're going to try Pentasan. Um, but this horse is sore enough when you flex its legs that it needs some extra help. We know what we're dealing with. We just want to make sure that there's nothing creeping up on us or, you know, that is compensating for having sore knees. So um, anyway, we did some injections and then we're going to manage the horse and see if we can keep them comfortable for longer or at least maybe a higher level of comfort than just injections alone with things like pentasan and again because of this horse's particularly particular case we may need things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories on occasion so um, she also uses a oral uh, hyaluronic acid um, and seems to believe that it helps benefit her horse. And the horse is also on an oil. So, you know, I like oils for multiple aspects, but for sure joint health. Um, and we know we have anti-inflammatory effect there. We know we're stabilizing the cartilage with pentasan we, and having a bit of anti-inflammatory effect there. We know that we're going to have a pain and anti-inflammatory effect with our non-steroidals. And I just want to use those to basically take the edge off as we need. Um, and then we're using the steroids and hyaluronic acid combinations for the in the joint injections to basically cut the pain and inflammatory response quick, get the horse to an acceptable level of comfort, use our other players to manage it from there on. So I think that fits kind of the bill, but the horse basically looked similar to its soundness last year, which was my cue to be like, I don't think we're dealing with anything new. So in that case, I felt comfortable, you know, injecting without having to reblock or image the horse extensively. But I said, you know, the horse is resistant when I flex the, the knees up and shows me a bit of a pain response, even though the range of motion is good. Do you want to look there just for peace of mind? And she said, yes. So we looked and it was a pretty good thumbs up today. So you know, that's kind of how I'd assess that. So you're not always just trying to find problems with the soundness. You're trying to kind of rule out and make sure that there isn't one. And that's a horse that we've managed for the last couple of years, I think. Yeah, two, three yeah, years. Two or yeah. three years. And so the client's been very, a very solid, I'd call avatar client because she comes and she wants radiographs taken. I think we've taken radiographs every year, which is, I don't know, I want to call, I don't want to call it overkill. It's just really nice that, that the client's open to that. And that's where you get those repeated visits and you can actually put together a real good story. And, yeah. and you were able to add in the Pentasan today to the yeah. protocol. She, she actually almost jumped in the air. She was relieved. She's like, I've worried about this for almost a year. So, you know, other ways to look at this are what's your peace of mind for knowing the information that is bothering you, you know? So I guess it's, it's mostly about your horse, but it's also about you. <laughs> yeah. 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 So true. Yeah. Um, somebody said, has this been videoed? So, so it could be rewatched. It has been recorded. So, you know, barring any technological issues that may arise, uh, it will be posted on our YouTube next week. Hopefully if, uh, if everything goes well so far, knock on wood, the last two have gone well. Um, so yes, this will be up on our YouTube channel next week. Somebody else said, uh, do injections cause damage to the joint? The more you inject because it helps with pain management. 
Also, thank you for asking that question. We'll give you, we're going to have to find out how to help out with some things. So that's a great question. And I actually wanted to address that and I forgot to put it in my talk. So thank you. There's a couple of, there's a couple of myths that I'd like to break about that. One is that injecting the joint actually breaks down the cartilage faster. That can happen, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. The second part of that question that I like is, and it is true, okay, and it's one of those things we have to think about is, if the horse does experience pain relief, they do use their body again, right? Do keep in mind that most of the work that we're doing, let's say like a tarsal arthritis, so a hawk arthritis or whatever, once that's started, we're not stopping that. Does that make sense? Like we, we just need to figure out how we're going to manage that horse through that pain as long as we possibly can. Hopefully it does fuse together. Once the joints fuse, then that pain will go away. So in that situation, yeah, when we're injecting those hawks, that is causing more destruction to that particular area. It was going to happen no matter what, though. Once the ball is rolling, we're not going to stop it, right? We're, we're accelerating it sometimes, um, but we're also keeping that horse in a position where it can be used, right? And be managed or be comfortable, even if it's not a horse that's being um, at a high level of competitive nature, but it's just a, a horse that someone wants to be more comfortable. As far as some of the stuff that I talked about with some of those young horses before, I think in my early years, by you know being afraid to inject joints at a certain stage, I was worried that I was going to do that. That was a very big concern. for. It's still a concern to this day, right? The one that's the trade-off for a lot of these young athletes that we have to be, be careful with is that if you have a horse that's been hawk sore for months on end, a lot of times we will see those athletes for a, a torn or a strained suspensory in the front, right? On the opposite leg. And those are the, the that's the trade-off, right? Is like, how do you do that? I guess. Right. And so I don't want to, I don't want to get too one-sided, but the, the answer to your question is yes, that can happen. The goal is to work with somebody inside of a relationship for us where we're seeing that horse on a routine basis that might be once every six months. It might be once every four months. It might be once a year, but we know what's going on with the horse and we're working to manage it to keep the pain at a level where the biomechanics stay straight or, or, or sorry, stay balanced. And at the same time, we don't destroy a joint that doesn't need to be destroyed. Right. I guess that's how I try to label that. I'll mm -hmm. leave that to you, Travis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess different, you know, there's, there's ways around these things too. So, um, over the years we've learned sometimes steroid type, um, sometimes the type of joint that we put a type of steroid in the levels that we use steroids at all of these things are usually what people are getting at when they're talking about like cartilage degradation and destruction of a joint. Um, I do think you'll have a little bit of difficulty sometimes teasing apart you know again was the arthritis already starting to go and then we injected the joint and you know then it just it slowed the arthritis but not to maybe the satisfaction of what the owner thinks it should be and so then you know next check-in we go oh well the joints look worse well you know we can either blame the steroid then or we can um maybe consider it's just a quickly progressing, you know, arthritis. I'd say if you didn't have that level and that rate of progression previous with a few check-ins and then, you know, you injected and saw, you know, significant advancement in the rate of arthritis between the same time period next year, well, then I'd say maybe there's some issues there. But we've gotten smarter over the years and basically dialed down the levels of our steroids, changed the types, watched, you know, where we put which steroids, high motion joints, low motion joints, those types of things um, to basically mitigate those risks. So some of the information that floats around is a bit outdated and um, the stuff that still holds true just has to be interpreted right. And again, this is where you can lean on your vets for that. So um, most vets will use a few common steroids so really the concoctions are similar sometimes just the levels are different depending on the practice or vet um but 
the other, th- I think the other scary thing, and probably what I see people do more is butyrbanamine their horse and run them on it. And I'm without soundness exams and without any supporting diagnostics. And I'm like that you'll break down your horse. So maybe not for sure. And they may need a little bit of help with butyrbanamine to run if your sport allows that. And that can be okay. But I just want people to remember that pain is protective and that your body's there's a point of having it there. So moderate, don't try to eliminate, I guess. All right. We will do a couple more and then we'll try to get these guys on the road and you guys, cause it's obviously a Friday afternoon. Um, Tammy, I don't know which Tammy it might, we have a couple Tammy's that are big uh, fans of the, the YouTube videos and the sports therapy lectures says, hi, Louisa. Um, are you so to you too, not to me. I can't answer this question. I'm not a veterinarian. Um, even though I pretend to be sometimes. Tammy <laughs> says, Are you seeing more kissing spine, possibly due to the raised awareness around it? And if so, depending on severity of the kissing spine, spines, does the use of injections help improve a situation or simply delay a surgical procedure? A bit, a bit about, loaded. <laughs> yeah. How about we get right into the really controversial stuff? This is this is as much as mask and no mask, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so do you want to go first or you want me to go first? Uh, it doesn't matter. I can get okay. I can give the spiel I yeah, give to cool. clients yeah. usually. So, and it's do you want to go? You <laughs> okay. no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um you put two guys on the telephone here that like to talk. Yeah, That's never it's a, a standoff. Thing. Yeah, it's a standoff. Go trap. I I basically just I think I think you've highlighted a lot of the points. So yes, I think it's on people's radar right now. And so we're looking more. So anytime you look more, you're probably gonna find more. So um we could, I guess, have some skewed data with the prevalence of kissing spine because we're searching harder and it's on people's you know topic list um but it's a very it's a confusing one for vets still right now because there's still some questions to be answered the questions are basically if we see a kissing spine is it clinically relevant um and we don't know and i've seen horses personally that I think there's almost no other way to explain what's going on with their lameness or with the signs that they're showing um, with rule outs of other key areas that may produce similar um, responses. Um, but I, th- I, b- I think basically if you went to say the race, excuse me, the racetrack and x-rayed everything's back, you'd probably find multiple horses with kissing spines that don't have a clinical problem yet, or at least one that we can detect. So um, I don't know if every horse necessarily needs to be treated the same way. And I don't necessarily agree that um, it, that injection uh, is just prolonging an inevitable surgery. I think it's a case by case basis for kissing spine until we know more information. Um, Some of the specialists have said that if you see um, changes in the facet joints of the vertebrae, as well as kissing spines, that they may place more clinical emphasis on those horses first horses that just have a kissing spine or touching touching spines on the top and no pathology or disease that we can see in the facet joints. So I guess my overall thing is with kissing spine, you got to look at each horse individually. If there's kissing spines present, that's a reason to dig deeper and maybe try therapies. Um, don't forget your specialists. Don't forget, um, you know, the people who might be able to aid in making surgical recommendations, um, and helping you decide if you go down a more medical management path of injecting or a surgical management path. I think there's going to be a group of horses that probably medical management won't touch and that will need a surgery. So in those cases, yes, I think you may be prolonging the inevitable, um, but there's sometimes reasons to do that. Um, Lean on your surgeon, lean on your specialist. Um, And then the ones that, you know, respond to medical management, some people may want to start there because it's usually less invasive. It's usually um, more inexpensive um, and the horse may respond very favorably. So if they do, you may not need to do a surgery. 
So that's that's why I think you got to look at them case by case with with kissing spine. Uh, great question too. Thanks for bringing it up. I'm sorry I was a little bit uh, dubious in the sort of um, it's a hot topic because it's very hot. Um, Travis and I are on the same page. It's one of those things when you take a set of radiographs in a pre-purchase exam or in a lameness exam and you have a bit of um, fluffiness and maybe it's not exactly where you want. I'm always praying that there's not anything even close, right? Because then I have to figure out how I'm going to explain it to the owner or to the purchaser. It fails the deal. Like it gets kind of, gets kind of a little bit trash, trashy and it's hard to figure out those ones that do have changes. You know, if they're clean, uh, then you're fine. If it's, if it's obliterated in there and, and it's five or six or seven of them and they're, you know, that now they're at the point where they're not even just touching, but they're overlapping and the horse is real sore and it's bucking the rider off and it can't be trusted. You know, then you get into a, an easier diagnosis. It's not necessarily easier treatment, but those definitely um, clinic, you know, case by case, that makes it a little bit simpler to work with. If we come back to the original start of my talk of the biomechanics, I do believe that biomechanics and the proper movement of the back and the axial skeleton does to contribute to a significant portion of these. Is it the only thing? No, I think there's some horses that are genetically, I don't like the word genetically set up for it, but there may be a little bit more predis predisposition based on where their bones sit. So I think those are a couple of things to consider as well. We're going to know more in the next, what, five years, you think? Because mm -hmm. there'll be some more retrospective yeah. studies and um, we'll start to put some things together, I think, right? More than we have now. Yeah. K keep in mind imaging. Imaging the horse and particularly the back end of the horse is really hard. So that's, a, you know, we seem a little wishy-washy with a, like, go oh, treat the individual and, you know, all that. But um, it's because we we haven't been able to look there and then if the ones that we have been able to look at sometimes people won't pay for that so it's if they don't want to look then we're we're limited too so um that's i think why there's still a lot of questions with this topic um i was just thinking of a horse that we're working on right now actually both chad and i chad diagnosed it with kissing spine earlier in the year um i have been injecting its back and also um have been treating it uh, from a gut health perspective for potential ulcers. Um, Cause again, both of those things can lead to explosive horses and to behavioral like irritability. And um, so we see both of those things in this horse. So now we're trying to work out, well, which one's which. So um, we've been injecting the back. Um, we've been treating the guts. We've had some positive improvement in behavior Again, I still can't tease those two things apart because we're treating them both at the same time. Um, however, the, we, re we requested the opinion of a surgeon um, and it was uh, his opinion that on this horse, we should try to inject the back with um, some steroid and to see the response. Um, cause we had been using more regenerative type medicines. And so now where I see this is he's looking for sort of a pain control type of thing where the regeneratives might get us there ultimately, but he wants to see what that horse may look like if its back is not in pain. So basically if we inject the back with something a little harder hitting the horse manages and stays that way and its behavior is reduced, you probably know that it's the back. You probably know that medical management may be favorable. If the horse progresses or medical management does not stick, that may be your indicator at surgery time. If um, the there's no response to the back at all, then I'd say it's the gut. So, you know, like sometimes we have to tease these things apart, but, you know, looking specifically at the back on that horse, it was the surgeon's recommendation. He probably could have said, yeah, let's do the surgery. Come on up. Um, but he said, let's try this first. So again, that can be surgeon preference um, or how their brain is, you know, working out what the best way they think to proceed is. So it's going to be a little bit case by case. I'd say the more severe advanced cases where the, there's a severe pain response and the spines are touching and there's no doubt about it, I'd say you might be closer to surgical territory, forget the medical management, again, request, request somebody else's opinion with a few more initials after their name.
Okay, I'm back. Uh, thanks, everyone. I think that's kind of it for today. Um, whoever's name is Nick Nicolay was the one that asked the uh, preventative soundness exam and radiograph questions. Chad was joking when he said we'd give them a thousand dollars, but she <laughs> she did she did say, "Can I use that money for Warren's next appointment?" But <laughs> No, you don't get a thousand dollars, but next time you come into the clinic, just, just mention Warren's name and maybe we'll have a little surprise for you. Um, there was a lot of really nice comments from everyone about what a great presentation this was. And we're super thankful. It's, uh, it's kind of bittersweet that we're in 2021 after a year of doing these, um, I guess almost now we're in year two of doing them online. We used to do them in real life. Um, and that was always fun to see everyone. And you know, Chad got to shake some hands and kiss some babies and that's his favorite thing to do. Um, but it is really cool. We had people from BC on the call today. I actually think we had a snowbird in Arizona. We won't tell anyone who it is, if that's an issue for some people, but that's awesome that we get to uh, engage with our clients across North America and beyond when we do these Zooms. So we're super glad that you guys were able to hang out with us today. I think for me, the big takeaways to remember is that this talk focused mostly on preventative medicine for the equine athlete. So making sure that you're not taking this and running with it. Each course, horse is an individual, of course, and working with your veterinarian, whether it's energy equine or whoever, whichever great vet that you use is super important. And I think both these brilliant gentlemen touched on that today, but that's something that's so key to remember, uh, especially when we're talking about equine athletes. And uh, obviously we didn't really touch on rehabilitation of injury today and how injections are utilized with that because it is so individualized to each horse. So those are just my takeaways as uh, a clinic director that gets to you know, ask a thousand questions to vets every day and also client owner myself. Gentlemen, do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we, uh, we end this wonderful afternoon? No, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. I saw a lot, a few familiar faces, so I can't see everyone, but I saw Stacy and Brandy, so I'll say hi to them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this will be up on YouTube next week for you guys to watch back. And uh, if you have any questions, if you want to bring your horse in for a soundness examination, um, just call us on the office phone here, shoot us an email, or you can touch base with us on Instagram or Facebook. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you guys all very soon in clinic with masks on.